All right, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to DCAG-T Live. Um, I want everyone to know that we are recording this session. It's gonna be able to be viewable later on the DCAG-T Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, as well as on our website. So I am Becca Coster, and I'm gonna be your moderator this evening. So before we get started, I'll just give you a very brief overview of what DCAG-T is. So DCAG-T stands for the Douglas County Association for Gifted and Talented. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're an all volunteer organization, and we are an affiliate of the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. So. In order to honor your time this evening, I want to introduce you to our speaker tonight. This is Joy Lynn. Um, Joy Lynn's going to be speaking with us about the social emotional development of the gifted um, and Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration. No, disintegration. I can never say that word, but Joy will say it several times and you all will know what we're talking about. Um, so Joy Lynn is a fourth year PhD student um, of curriculum and instruction and she's specializing in gifted education leadership at the University of Denver. Um, she works as a graduate research assistant with Dr. Norma Hafenstein. Nice. Um, as an adjunct professor of the teacher's education um, program's gifted education workshop, as well as um, the director of professional education um, with the Gifted Development Center. Um, I personally love the Gifted Development Center, so I was very excited to read that. Um, she serves on the board of Soul Spark Learning and is a co-founder of um, the Gifted and Talented Leaders of Colors and Allies. She volunteers as the Gifted Youth Coordinator for um, Denver Mensa. And um, she's interested in supporting um, the career development and well being of gifted and um, the professionals who support them. Um, she lives in Littleton with her fiance, and um, she has new seedlings for her garden. So welcome so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We're so excited to have you, Joy Lynn. Thank you so much, Becca, and for the Douglas County Association for Gifted and Talented for having me today. Let's see. Hello, I'm Joy. I use she and her pronouns. And as Becca said, I'm very involved with Denver Mensa. I'm a student at the University of Denver and an adjunct professor there. And I work with the Gifted Development Center as well. So today, Becca started us off with the welcome and introductions. I'm gonna talk about Kashmir Jabrowski and his work, starting with overexcitabilities and how the overexcitabilities are placed within his larger theory of positive disintegration. Then we'll have time for discussion for audience members to also generate and brainstorm ideas and strategies for self, home, and school. I will share some resources for more information and then later there is time for any additional questions and answers. And Becca, I have given you some um, resources that you can share where you need to when it's time. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Let's dive in. So my objectives for you today are for you to gain familiarity with the theory of positive disintegration, recognize overexcitabilities and intensities in your child, and brainstorm strategies to stimulate and manage OE and development across different settings. Kazimierz Dabrowski was a Polish psychiatrist who lived through both world wars and was really um, astounded by the depths of human horrible behavior. And after living through World War I and II, really started to wonder what, what was the difference between people that did abhorrent things and people that sometimes didn't or people that changed what they were doing. And in his work with gifted people, um, really started looking at like suicide and um, just struggles people were having. And through all of that work, put together his theory of positive disintegration 
And you can visit positivedisintegration.com to access more of Dabrowski's specific works and presentations as well. But we're going to talk about one piece of the theory first and then do a little overview of how that fits. So overexcitability, OE. I wonder if any of you have heard this term before. Um, oops. In Dabrowski's theory, OE is a heightened physiological experience of sensory stimuli resulting from increased sensitivity of the neurons. Dabrowski used the phrase psychic overexcitability and defined it as higher than average responsiveness to stimuli manifested by either psychomotor, sensual, emotional, imaginational or intellectual excitability or a combination thereof. And I do have some gifts that are gonna flash and I just wanted to warn the audience in case you're looking and that might bother you. So let's dig into each of the OE. And I think as we go, you will recognize some of these aspects in your children and in yourselves. So let's talk about psychomotor. So psychomotor overexcitability has some benefits. There might be high energy, alertness, and eagerness. They may seek to organize things and people and have a robust physical skill and ability. But with this might come some challenges, such as frustration with inactivity. The person might be seen as hyperactive and a lot of um, Dabrowski's observations really line up with how we currently conceptualize ADHD. They might construct com complicated rules or are often seen as bossy. It might be jittery, bouncy, or chatty. I actually score very high on all of the overexcitabilities, but I was like, I'm not athletic. I don't have psychomotor OE. But when I saw the rules and the chattiness and the organizing and the bossiness, that really did resonate with me and my experience and that sort of nervous energy that is so strong and pervasive. So this might look like some of these. Just that gotta go, go, go. Won't stop talking, always has something to say. Lots of high energy. I spoke with um, some teachers about overexcitabilities once and two gentlemen were like, we don't have these. But then they scored high for psychomotor. And then upon reflection, they both biked to work and I and use the stairs all the time. And I thought they're, th those are their ways they are self-stimulating and really um, meeting their psychomotor overexcitability needs. The second OE we'll talk about today is sensual. Um, Dr. Hafenstein and some of these um, slides are from her. She calls this her chocolate um, OE. So benefits, personal appreciation of art or other sensory experiences, discriminating taste and design strengths, challenges. They might have negative impacts of crowds, overeating or overindulgence in other areas, clothing limitations and buying sprees. And I think there's already a lot of understanding that students with giftedness are likely to be highly sensitive to different things. But the sensor, sensual OE, um, it's, it's like it's too much. It's over and above and beyond. And um, some people with very, very high levels of sensual OE might struggle with tags in their shoes and pebble, I'm sorry, pebbles in their shoes and tags in their shirts. They might struggle with that flickering light in the conference room. They might struggle with the sound of the fan in the classroom. It might distract and really limit their ability to focus on other things. So, you know, with each of these, we have to think about what are ways we can healthily stimulate and express and strengthen our OEs? And then what are ways we can mitigate and, um, I don't know, use headphones or audio filters, for example, to cut down on some of the distraction and the noise? Um, 
I'm sure some sexual things could be included, but this isn't about sexual sensuality. This is about sensory sensuality and just thinking about that. And this might look like, here we go. So some stuff really good, some stuff really intense, um, really enjoying what you see, having rich experiences, maybe going to Meow Wolf, um, really enjoying something like that. A third overexcitability is emotional OE. Benefits, emphasizes truth, equity, and fair play, high expectations of self and others, sensitivity, empathy, desire to be accepted by others. Challenges, worries about humanitarian concerns, intolerant, perfectionistic, possibly depressed, sensitivity to criticism and peer rejection. And what I really like to highlight here with emotional OE is there's a little bit of knowing yourself and your own emotional state and regulating a little bit. But there's also this big component that is about the relationship with other people and really invokes empathy. And some people, some gifted students have high emotional overexcitabilities and may feel so strongly um, different things. They may experience that rejection so hard or may be so concerned about whatever current event was recently very horrible. They might be very concerned about um, climate change or the environment and really feel that anxiety and stress. So that emotional OE is very important and I think um, really resonates with a lot of the population of gifted people. And I'm saying gifted, this is a gifted presentation, but the theory and the overexcitabilities those are just about humanity. And um, all people might find things they connect with here. But we'll talk more about giftedness in a minute. So emotional OE might look like some of these. I feel your pain. Um, Lisa says, I know, maybe we can get people to sign a petition. You know, trying to organize to do something, to make a change because of being distraught about something. I just have a lot of feelings. And then uh, down here, here's Sheldon with formal protest, formal protest. Imaginational overexcitability has several benefits, such as a person might be creative, inventive, or like new ways of doing things. They might be highly intuitive. They can create fandoms. And you think about like um, Tolkien or um, JK or, um, students in your classrooms and homes that are writing complicated stories, or maybe they don't write them, but they think and talk about them, or they have imaginary friends. Some challenges with imaginational OE. A person might be seen as disruptive or out of step. They may get caught and um, scolded for daydreaming, and they may have an imaginary reality. And once again, a lot of people can have strong creative potential and imagination. Um, for overexcitabilities, it's like a little bit more, a little, a little more intense, extra intense. And I think um, sometimes thinking some things are real when they aren't, um, having that rich imaginary friend relationship, um, those might be expressions of such a overexcitability. So here's what it might look like. And I guess I, I like to draw attention to the bottom left one where this person is feeling, I think the gift shows that they're feeling like they're being pushed around a little bit, but are those people just accidentally bumping? And this is hard. And I think in our, in our era of being aware of like gaslighting, it's not like you want to say you aren't being bumped, but maybe they didn't intend it negatively and talking through with a child and trying to process why something may have happened, why they may feel some way can, um, I think, go a long way to helping them develop control of their overexcitabilities and strengths. The fifth overexcitability, Dabrowski mentioned, 
plus intellectual OE. So I have two slides of the benefits and challenges. So we'll start here. Benefits acquires and retains information quickly. Inquisitive searches for significance, enjoys problem solving, able to conceptualize, abstract, and synthesize. Strong sense of humor, which I thought was very interesting and correct. Challenges, impatient with others, dislikes routine. Oh my gosh, is that mean? Asks embarrassing questions, excessive interest. Resists routine practice, questions teaching procedures, questions home procedures. Well, why do I have to do the dishes this way or do them right now or et cetera, et cetera. Peers may misunderstand humor, may become the class clown for attention. They'll have a large facile vocabulary, advanced information, intense concentration, long attention span and persistence in areas of interest. Seeks cause and effect relationships. Why? Independent, prefers individualized work relevant to themselves. Um, diverse interests and versatility. More challenges. May use words to manipulate. May be bored with school age peers or content. May neglect duties or people during times of focus, may resist interruptions and be stubborn. May dislike unclear or illogical areas, such as traditions or feelings. May reject parent or peer input and not conform. May appear disorganized or frustrated over lack of time to do things thoroughly and well. And I think especially with our population that we're talking about today, a lot of this strongly resonates with many of you. And what I really like is to look at both the benefit and the challenge, right? The positive manifestations that sometimes we want and encourage and the negative manifestations that sometimes are challenging at home or school. And um, here are some ways intellectual OE might look. And I guess for the middle, I just wanted to express, it's not just about books and academic reading. You could have that intellectual curiosity about nature or plants or um, other, other creatures as well. All right, so here is a moment for some discussion. And Becca's gonna help me out and highlight a few things. But on whatever platform you're watching this right now, it might be Facebook Live or YouTube, or e you can email, I believe, as well. Let's take a few moments and just think about describing how you or your child stimulate overexcitabilities, either positively or negatively. What are some good things you guys are doing that really satisfy that itch? And what are some things that are challenging? Let's just give you a few minutes. So while, while people are thinking and, and if they um, are comfortable typing in, please do go ahead um, or you can email um, info at dkt.org. Um, I, um, I, my parents live with me as well as my daughter. So um, as as Joy is describing these different excitabilities, I can see them um, in my parents and then in um, in myself and then in my child as well. Um, but one of the, the things that um, resonated was um, that sensual overexcitability in clothes, so my mom cannot stand a tag, and she often will wear her clothes inside out. Um, good thing she doesn't know how to um, watch anything on the internet, um, <laughs> because she would not like me disclosing. Um, and then I always have a seam ripper handy, and I always know where it is, because my daughter cannot stand tags. So there's a lot of times where she'll be like, there's a tag in my clothes and I have to seam rip it. I mean, it's immediate and it's a need. So um, that's something that resonated with me right away. And I see that um, that Jenny um, uh, put in never stops talking. Never stops talking. 
yeah. the sensual, I think of that as the princess and the pea, if you know that. Um, yes. Story. And just can feel extra. And a lot of these overexcitabilities really are showing um, ways of intense sensitivity. And some people talk about it like, um, I don't know, if you're old enough, you might remember like bunny ear antennas for your television, right? And you would get a little bit of signal and it'd be a little fuzzy and you might have to hold it by the window to watch your favorite show. Um, and now we have like cable, but having strong OEs, it's like having that satellite TV and it's 4K and it's so many channels and it's overwhelming how much data you're taking in sometimes because all of your apertures are fully open um, or, you know, whatever your combination of apertures is. Right. Not everyone has all of the overexcitabilities at the same level and not every gifted person has all five and people that don't identify as gifted may still have one or two, you know, all of those are um, possible. Yes, definitely. And then, and then Marcus um, writes, um, my 50 year old OE is leaning into anxiety. She is so empathetic and such a feeler that sometimes she can't function. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Can almost be de destabilizing, right? Um, yes. Yeah. And let's yeah. see, there's one more anonymous comment. Every single thing describes my child. The imagination one has been a challenge when situations with peers have been over dramatized. There we go. Like when my child did something wrong and suddenly went on the run to avoid vigilante justice, thinking their classrooms were coming to drag them to face the music. And, you know, occasionally that impulse serves us well and would keep your child from harm. Sometimes that isn't the actual situation, right? And having that conversation um, about the imaginational and, well, what really happened and did you talk about it? You know, those are some strategies that might help tame that um, panic that's happening. Becca, was there any more you wanted to share before I move on? Yeah, so there's one more. Tiny sounds bug the heck out of me. Some teachers leave their projectors on all day. I only want it on while I'm doing direct instruction because it makes a little sound. Also, only silent fidgets. If they're doing Rubik's Cubes, it's too noisy. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yes. Um, I'll share one more of mine, too, around this intellectual. Um, there's a doctoral student graduating soon from the University of Denver, Anne Maki Kali, and she, for her work, she um, interviewed gifted women who are undergraduates in college. And one of the findings she shared with me that resonates with this intellectual OE is she was surprised at how much they had hobbies. They were in clubs. They were learning things on the side. And I told her, well, right now, I don't have many hobbies. Being a doctoral student is my big hobby. But before, it's always something. One time I went down the quilting rabbit hole hard or painting or chakras or anything. And there's just that insatiable curiosity about things I'm interested in and that desire and ability to find ways to learn more about it. And I think the internet has, you know, for its pros and cons, has provided a lot of people with access to so much information. And, you know, you have to know how to have some media literacy and shake it out what's true and not or reliable. But I think um, that's such a great gift for so many um, people with that high intellectual overexcitability. Okay, so we talked about OE. I think OE is really easy for people to connect with because they see these things happening all the time. But overexcitabilities is not Dabrowski's theory. Dabrowski's theory is the theory of positive disintegration. And let's talk about this a little more. So Dabrowski used the term developmental potential to refer to the constellation of psychological features that he believed were associated with advanced personality development. These characteristics included three main features or factors, special abilities and talents, 
like athletic or unique musical ability, the five forms of overexcitability, and the third factor, a strong autonomous drive to achieve individuality. And number three is big and huge. Drive is such a big deal. There's a book called Drive even. Um, this is motivation, right? But it's not just motivation to do, it's motivation to grow as a person. You realize that you could be a better person if you only did X, Y, Z. And you desire and strive and hope and practice to get closer to that if you have that strong drive. And that makes a lot of difference difference, right? Someone can say, oh, I see how I should have done the dishes, but I don't care enough to try better the next time. Or someone might try better the next time. And then there were also three factors of development, such as the hereditary part, the endowment that people are born with, the social environment, and that's really important because that's where we live, you know, after birth. It's the social environment that rules the day and thinking about um, what is the environment at your home? Do you have some weird thing that's making a weird noise all the time? Is that disrupting your children from doing their homework? You know, um, is that happening at school? And then that conscious choice, really being intentional and thoughtful. So Dabrowski talked about five primary levels of development. And the more overexcitability you, you have, both in intensity and like the number, the more likely you might be to have that developmental art go further. And that's where that OE is fitting into his larger theory. But let's talk about where you might develop to. So level one is primary integration. Um, some of Dabrowski's students split this into 1A and 1B, with 1A being your instinctive, purely selfish self, what would you do if you could? So um, some people might um, not integrate well with society and may do whatever they impulsively feel, and that would be that primary integration. Everything's fine. It makes sense to you, the person. You know what to do when you have a problem that comes up. You do what you want, right? So that's what I... And then 1B is social sort of um, integration, where you rely on what you've learned by your religion, by your government, by that book you just read. You find something else outside of self and that drives your decision-making and value system and you're still integrated, it's great. You now know how to solve problems because you have this code book, this rule book that you default to. Um, and a, a very authoritarian um, family might have that integration, right? It might be the parent's perspective that is absolute. And as long as a child makes decisions that meet that parent's expectations, everything's integrated and fine. Everything's integrated and fine. But people tend to at least get to level two a lot of the time. And level two is unilevel disintegration. So somewhere on one, in one area of life, you experience something that challenges what you think you knew. And you have this moment of disintegration. And, um, I identify as a cisgender heterosexual woman. Um, I was raised very religious and a, I will share my story of unilevel disintegration here. Um, a very good Christian friend of mine, we used to do Christian retreats together, um, came out to me and we were like on the phone and um, I started crying and I told him, you're going to hell. And he started crying and said, if God is love, then why can't I love who I love? And I thought about it and I did not have a good answer. And for me, that, that was a big critical level two moment for myself. 
And I started to question not only that part of what I'd been taught in my religious tradition, but also other pieces. And these levels, it's not like you get to level two and then you're done. You might go up and down. Um, it might be a little different in different areas of your life. Um, but for me, this definitely led to level three, which is spontaneous multi-level disintegration. So if you see one thing have some contradiction and it bothers you, this could be something like um, a parent saying no dessert before dinner, but then the child sees the parent eat that cookie before dinner and they're like, whoa, mind blown. Maybe it doesn't have to be the way I thought it had to be, right? And then spontaneous multi-level disintegration. All of a sudden, with one little piece that's loose, you start to look around and out of nowhere, you start to see different contradictions that don't fit what you thought you knew, what you thought was fully integrated, what you thought helped you make decisions and guided your value system. All of a sudden that's breaking down and you look over there and there's an issue and you're like, oh no, that doesn't reconcile with what I thought or this is an issue. Oh no. Um, there's some thought and research around a lot of people tend to stay in level one or two. And when level two happens, they block out that contradiction and they retreat to level one and they say, I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to just go back to my code book, my rule book, my whatever, whatever is um, they're integrating around. But some people do end up in level three. Dabrowski found that this was the level with the most distress and mental health um, neuroses because people were feeling anxious, depressed, um, feeling like there might not be a purpose or a worth to things. And um, that's just, it's, it's not a great place to spend a lot of time. And hopefully, and if if you have that drive, if you have that social environment opportunity and exposure to more to different dialogue and discourse, you know, you might, you might start to reach level four, which is directed multi-level disintegration. So spontaneous, the world is just happening to you almost out of nowhere. Oh my gosh, contradiction. Level four, you start to direct it yourself and go, wait a second, this was contradictory over here. I'm disintegrating that down. I should look at this other topic. So I know like um, looking at nutrition, for example, breaking apart things I'd learned about nutrition in the 90s and rebuilding what I've learned, um, looking at it more carefully now, um, that's a way to direct that disintegration. Um, I had one more point, but maybe I'll just continue. And then maybe, just maybe, someone reaches level five, secondary integration. Level one starts with, say, um, a Lego kit. And it has the instructions and you make it and now you're fully integrated. You've built the thing. But then you realize through levels like four, that you can break apart the Lego and put it back together however you want, not in the same way, but in a new way. So you can take the good, whatever's good to you, you can take the good from different sources in your life and start to build your own system of values and um, of decision-making guidance. And if you can reach that where you just live your values every day and don't have that conflict because you already know, then you'd be a magical unicorn of a level five. Um, I know when uh, Dabrowski, I think, was first writing, I think he said two people had reached level five, Jesus and Gandhi. I think um, some other scholars have added a few others like Peace Pilgrim. Um, level five is like an asymptote of maybe one day you can sort of get there, but taking steps toward that is a big deal for you and your child. Part of what helps people move through the steps of positive disintegration, and it's positive because 
it's a good thing. You, it's a good thing to break down what was there so you can rebuild and renovate for the future. But some of these are dynamisms, which are these psychological processes. So some of the major dynamisms that Dabrowski saw as part of disintegration included anxiety and dissatisfaction with oneself. You realize that you could be better. Shame and guilt over not being as good. Inferiority. Subject object. So sort of not just treating yourself and others as um, objects, just objectively factual, Becca is sitting in a chair, but looking at her a little more subjectively, Becca's sitting in a chair because this is a long meeting. She's sitting in a chair because she's at home. Thinking through a person's um, other experiences that might be happening can help, uh, or is a dynamism, right? So for the person who shared the comment that um, the child who ran away, you think that the object is these other students being villains, but if you subjectively think about those other students were feeling this way or frustrated or having a bad day, you know, that brings in that nuance. Then there's that third factor, that motivation and drive toward betterment. And I think this is probably the most magical part of the theory, right? Because if you could magically make everyone want to do better, um, probably the world would be a better place. Maybe, we'll see. And then personality ideal, the ability to recognize and vision and create and conceptualize and using that imaginational, right? Using that emotional connection. Imagine what your personality ideal would be. If you can't do that, you're not going to take steps toward it. So being able to imagine the ideal really helps move along the disintegration. And my um, dear friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Wells, and I have some resources of Chris's I'll share later. Um, she's highlighted for me that the big deal about Dabrowski and why this is such a fascinating, radical theory, even now, and why you should be excited about it is a lot of this is viewed as like mental illness, mental distress. Um, things that should be medicated away, things that shouldn't be talked about, et cetera. But Dabrowski found these, this mental distress as critical, as critical for positive disintegration. And this idea that when you are feeling these things, when your child is going through these things, that doesn't have to be the end all be all. With a little bit more help and encouragement, they might be able to move closer out of that into their personality ideal. But to get there, they're gonna have to break down what was default and start to customize their life and personality to be who they imagine as their ideal self. And then, oh yeah, big theory, huge theory. I love it, it makes me really um, reflect differently on society in particular. Um, but giftedness, where does it fit? So research was shown, research showed that people with strong emotion, intellectual, emotional, and imaginational OE tended to perhaps score higher on other measures of giftedness. And what's funny is, even though I wrote it in this order, emotional OE was the most important. So when we are identifying, um, students in schools, for example, we might be really looking for that intellectual overexcitability. But it's the students with that emotional overexcitability that also probably have very high intelligence, probably are very sensitive, probably are taking in lots of information as well. So I guess my point is, if someone you know is very high on intellectual, emotional, and imaginational overexcitability, they might want to either get referred, for giftedness, either in Douglas County. I saw that as a parent, you can fill out a form on the Douglas County website and submit it for the referral process. Or there's a giftedness in adults rating scale. Um, I can share that link with you later, Be Becca. But just know, I, um, hmm. because people with giftedness have that strong intellectual endowment to start, because if we label them as gifted in Colorado schools, they tend to get services and that social nurturance, right? Gifted people have some strong potential 
to develop further along this trajectory of Dabrowski's. And because of that, gifted ed education really um, appreciated and took on Dabrowski's theory. But his theory, as I said earlier, is for all humanity. So just because this is popular and gifted education, it's still applicable to the rest of society as well. And I just wanted to make that point because I know we talk about Dabrowski a lot in the gifted circles, but. And here's a nice little um, Sheldon moment of, I'm not crazy, my mother had me tested. And I put this here because I find that when I talk about this with a lot of people, including a student I have with me in class, she's like, oh, this explains my whole life. I need to send this presentation to my mother. And, you know, a lot of gifted people go through life or people with strong OE go through life feeling like they are not fitting in or they're, they're at odds with the world and the environment. And when they understand that there's a name for this and it has positives and negatives and there are ways you can strengthen it, um, that can really help uh, make someone not feel so out of sync. So let's have a little more time for discussion. And I basically have sort of the same prompts three times for different settings. Then I'll share a few resources with the group and then we'll have time for additional Q&A. Let's start with the discussion. So reflection questions on self. How do my child's overexcitabilities or the theory of positive disintegration manifest in their self? And then what strategies could my child practice to self-regulate? So let's give you guys a couple minutes to jot some ideas down, preferably in the chat so other people can share and learn. But if you want to just write for yourself, that's that's great, too. And I guess I'm going to be my own child right now. But um, one strategy I use to self-regulate is to listen to music. And, you know, it could be aggressive, pump it up work out a lot, high heart rate music, or it could be calming, soothing, or happy and upbeat music, right? And thinking about how intentionally exposing myself to each of those types of music are going to change my state a little bit into each of those directions, right? So that's just one way I might choose to self-regulate for my sensory, sensual OE. Someone shared in the chat, my three and a half year old son has a strong memory that if he has had a bad experience with a person or place, he won't want anything to do with that person or place ever. And the bad experience may not even be big for others. That's an issue. And then you as a parent, and I mean, each child's different and you know, we'll see what happens with your son, but as a parent, do you prevent any additional exposure to that scenario or do you do some more like soft exposure therapy and practice exposure to some of those situations and calm and safe and small ways to kind of inoculate and develop that child's ability to be in other environments and it depends on what it is you know I don't particularly love snakes I don't need a lot of snake exposure therapy things but um but if when I didn't like dogs, I was scared of dogs, getting to know dogs that were friendly, um, getting to learn how to approach a dog, those strategies definitely helped me sort of overcome that issue. Becca, is there anything to share from the chat? Not at this time. All right. I will keep going so we can get to the Q&A, but I'll just add, add as you think of it. Reflection questions for home. How do my child's overexcitabilities and theory of positive disintegration manifest at home? What strategies could we try at home? I 
And and while you all are thinking, um, I'll just share that uh, when my daughter was younger, um, I would pick her up from school and she would say she's peopled out. And um, she'd say, I cannot talk. And so we would be very quiet and she'd be very quiet all the way home. And then she'd say, okay, I'm gonna go into my room and I'll be out later. Mm -hmm. And then she would come out when she was ready and could be around people again, because just being around that many people was just too much. I think my favorite part of that story is your daughter's language and self-advocacy and that ability to express verbally so you would understand how she was feeling. And then your respect of her and her boundaries allowed her to, you know, refresh over time. That's great. That's great. Here's another. Let's see. We do deep belly breathing and yoga has actually been a big help, mostly because it takes so much concentration to not fall over that we can't hyper focus on the other things. That's great. That's great. Yes, something physical can um, take someone out of their mind in a good way um, or vice versa. Um, I think for like the emotional, having strategies, having ways to self-regulate and um, de-escalate emotions, um, having ways to take action positively in support of emotions. Let's make handmade cards for your teachers this year. Let's call grandma every week or whatever, however frequently, you know, um, really nurturing your child that has that empathetic response with people can go a long way. Oops, and then I didn't change the top, but reflection questions for school. How do my child's OEs and TPD manifest at school? What strategies could we try and advocate for at school? So let's, let's take imaginational. So, or psychomotor, um, maybe they are daydreaming all the time and getting in trouble for zoning out in class. Maybe you could try to advocate for exposure to some of the arts, especially in an area of interest. If at school they can't sit still and they're getting in trouble for walking out of the room or um, physically wrestling with other children, maybe some strategies could be a wiggle chair or a conversation with the teacher around flexible seating or the need to pace quietly in the back of the room. Um, maybe it's enrollment in after club sports or activities to use that physical energy in a good constructive way. So it's not being used in a detrimental or a, um, dissatisfactory way. Right. Yeah. One of the, um, things that, uh, one of the teachers my daughter had, um, she she taught a fiber arts um, section. So they learned how to um, hand knit and hand crochet. And so um, if they needed to fidget, they could get out their projects and create things while they listened. And that was one thing that really, really helped her. That's great. You know, and you're, you're talking about that in a school setting. I know adults that do that and they'll knit or crochet in a meeting because that's their doodling, if you will. Um, so being open to people expressing and um, satisfying their overexcitabilities as a parent, as an educator, that's really important as a family member. Mm -hmm. Let's see, there's a little bit more here. My son was overwhelmed doing math tonight and we asked him if he wanted a minute to cry it out. He said yes and had a private moment to just release before getting back to work. Great strategy, cry it out. Um, sometimes I offer people, do you want a hug? Because that oxytocin can flow with that physical skin contact, right? And just having a long hug. Um, sometimes my partner is very stressed and will hug in like eh, 15 seconds in there's like a release and I, you know, I try to make sure we get to that point before we go back to whatever was being tense in the moment. Um, here's another strategy for school. Having texture strip stickers was a huge help and the pedals under the desks 
<laughs> and someone says they're knitting right now, which is fun and delightful too. Okay, let's talk about some resources for y'all. So Becca, can you take that giant chat I did at the beginning? Oh, it didn't all go. Hold on, Becca. I'm going to give it to you in two chunks. Okay, sounds good. Chunk one. And then... Chunk two. Sorry, I cut it off. Oh, no worries. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's let you see what it is. Too. So for further reading, there are several great books about um, Dabrowski's theory and this, this intensity. So one is Michael Pahofsky's Mellow Out, They Say, If I Only Could. And a lot of parents really appreciate that book. The next book is Living with Intensity, edited by Susan Daniels and Pahofsky. And... Um, this one's a touch more academic, but really gets into some research studies around overexcitabilities and positive disintegration and that intensity, that overwhelming intensity. And, you know, if you are interested in this, that's a really good place to start a living with intensity book. There's also a, I haven't read this one in particular, but there's a smart teen's guide to living with intensity, which could be of help. And then there's some other um, books related specifically more to Dabrowski's research. So personality shaping through positive disintegration from Dabrowski, Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration. And then um, one of his uh, primary students, Bill Tillier, wrote personality development through positive disintegration as well. And, um, you know, you can get these at Amazon or gifted ad conferences from the vendors or similar. There is also a podcast, a positive disintegration podcast with Emma Nicholson and um, Dr. Chris Wells, and they're interviewing different people. I believe they'll interview me sometime in August, but um, this is also a great way, especially if you're auditory focused, um, for you to hear a little bit more, learn a little more about the theory and people's growth. And then, because I happen to wear different hats sometimes, at, at the University of Denver, um, my professor, Dr. Norma Hafenstein, is hosting the Dabrowski Congress 2022. And this typically happens every other year, and it's loosely international, often in Canada, the US, and sometimes in Poland. But um, this year, it's July 18 and 19. It's a Monday, Tuesday, and it will be hosted virtually and also in person at the University of Denver. So if you are living in the metro area like you are Douglas County, I would encourage you to check it out, maybe register and maybe come attend and get to learn from some scholars and experts. And um, for our keynotes, we have Dr. Chris Wells as one of our keynotes, Dr. Frank Falk, Dr. Sheila Gallagher, who's the current um, president or president-elect of the National Association for Gifted Children. She'll be doing a keynote. And then we also have um, Melissa Bernstein, who's one of the co-founders of Melissa and Doug Toys. And she'll be talking about Lifelines, her book, and sort of her process of disintegration. So I really encourage you to check that out as well. And my email address is at the bottom, but Let's, we have a few minutes left. If there are any questions, please add it to the chat. And you can reach out to me on Twitter at joylynco. Email me at joi.lin at du.edu. Or email me at mincajoyl, joyl at gmail.com. And I, I guess I put all the Mince stuff here because that's sort of how I met um, Jen Strickland way back when doing um, some volunteer work with Denver Mensa. So thank you so much for coming to my presentation. And I will stop sharing. Yeah. And Becca, let me know if there are any questions. Otherwise, you can wrap it up. Do. And while we're waiting, if people are uh, formulating, typing their questions in, Joy, I just wanted to thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, as I said before, um, because um, my parents live with me. I just found it so interesting um, to listen to what you had to teach us and then to, to look at sort of that three generational sort of look.
um, at, at what, um, what I was seeing. So here at home. Um, and then uh, it looks like we do have a couple questions. So one is, could you please elaborate some more on level five, the secondary integration? All right. So Dabrowski's idea around level five is that as you've broken down what you thought you knew, you've now put it back together. And in level four, you're putting it back together over here. And then you work and you put it back together over here. But there's not some grand comprehensive cohesiveness or simplicity to it. Dabrowski viewed level five, that secondary integration, where all the issues that you might have had to deal with are resolved. And now you can handle work, um, not just work, you can handle life with confidence and you know how to handle issues when they come up because you've already established like your schema for dealing with them. Personally, and this is just my, my takes on this, but hey, I'm the one presenting. Um, I think that secondary integration is very, is more easily obtained in a um, sort of singular culture or environment. I think you can break down what you learn, you can figure out how to function in your zone. I am having trouble, and maybe this is just my not being level five-ness, but I am having trouble trying to get to an idea where not only is my comprehensive system good enough for me, but also good enough to force on others. I don't have children yet. If I have children, I'm going to give them my schema, right? That's how we're going to run things. As an educator, I have to not only have understanding of how I'm going to behave, but also how I expect my students to behave. And is that coming from some policy or federal law? Or is that coming from an awareness and adaption to who's in my classroom? Or is that coming from my other religious or governmental or rule books on the side? You know, there's that question, where is it coming from? But with secondary integration, you really figured it all out and can move and live each day with grace, living your highest values, which I think it's very difficult. And I guess um, I would encourage a person because Dabrowski does not make it seem like everyone's going to make it to level five. <laughs> but I would encourage people to try to strive for that level four and that thoughtful dismantling of pieces of your knowledge and that reconstruction in a way that you value more. So let's see, um, for example, as a kid, I only liked things like white bread and pastas and rice and I loved it and it was great and I was integrated in what I knew to eat. And there were things I learned from society such as fat is bad and don't eat any of that, you know. But now I've had to break that down and think about, no, you need healthy fats and let's add some of that whole grain. But I still sometimes make bad choices. So I'm definitely not a level five with my day-to-day -day living and consistency of being my best ideal self. I can still tell you I have a lot of work to do. So I think we need to have that grace. Um, and then just to reiterate, when people get to level three, there's a risk they'll get stuck there and they'll never start to take control and ownership of their choices and their beliefs. And um, as parents and educators, we're in a position to be able to nurture and encourage that or to stifle it and um, just be prepared for people with that developmental potential to experience a phase of mental distress while they reconcile through some things. All right, it looks like we have a couple other um, questions. So um, first of all, um, Joy mentioned um, Jen Strickland and um, Jen is the vice president of DHEGT and she's also um, in the background this evening um, fielding questions. So thank you to Jen. Thanks, Jen. Um, 
And then there's a couple more questions. So um, how do you know the difference between an overexcitability and ADHD? That is quite a question that still needs some more academic research conducted. Um, I think some people would straight up say they're basically the same thing. He was talking about stuff as the DSM was identifying ADHD. So this is something um, practitioners were seeing in the population. I think the, the clearest connection is going to be between psychomotor and the hyperactivity half of ADHD. And then there's some question about what about the inattentive part. So that one might be a little harder, but you know, they're sort of the same and, and, and I've heard some of this from Chris, you know, um, you don't want to just think that it's only OE, you don't need to treat the ADHD and some many ADHD strategies can help. Sometimes medication can also be very effective with some people. So you don't want to not look at strategies on both sides, but at the same time, ADHD does not have to be as viewed as fully debilitating as it might be perceived in your home or school setting, especially if you're finding ways to nurture and to practice and to strengthen um, strategies. So I would say look at the overexcitabilities and think about ways you can um, nurture things in a good way. And then also look at the DSM and also look at the ADHD criteria because in particular ADHD's differences, you can get some um, educational support and services for that. But to my knowledge, no one's uh, helping with overexcitabilities at a systemic level. Wonderful. All right. Well, it looks like we are beyond our time. And so to honor everyone's time, um, I just want to say thank you again, Joy. It's been wonderful. Um, this is our last DCAG T Live for this school year. So we will be back next school year. Um, look for us then. So thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night.